Welcome, everyone. This is Kristen Markley, and this is the first webinar for the Southern SOG Food Hub Learning Network. This is a program that is organized by Southern SOG and funded through Southern SARE. And the co-facilitators of the Southern SOG Food Hub Learning Network are Keith Richards with Southern SOG and also myself, Kristen Markley. And the National Farm to School Network is providing the service today to host and archive the webinars. So I want to thank Chelsea Simpson with the National Farm to School Network for handling the technical details of this webinar. And um, also want to remind folks that we do have a question box on your control panel. If you open up if you click on the little arrow next to questions, it'll open up the, the box and you can type in any questions that you have there. And uh, we are going to have a follow-up conference call a couple weeks after the webinar. So if you're not able to get all of your questions answered today, we will have another opportunity for that. And I will mention that day and time in just a minute. Uh, but just uh, to remind everybody, the, the title of the webinar today is So You Think a Food Hub is Right for You. And today's speakers are Eric Benfeld with Virginia Cooperative Extension, Tina Pravat with First Hand Foods, and Kathleen Terry with Appalachian Sustainable Development. And Keith and I want to thank them for sharing their time and their expertise during this webinar. I think uh, we're really going to get a lot of great information and great insight. And these are the questions that appeared in the description that you received regarding this webinar. So we're actually going to use those questions to structure the agenda. So it's, it's going to work a little bit differently than a typical webinar might work. We're going to have each speaker address each question. So we're going to jump around a little bit from speaker to speaker so that each speaker can address each of these questions. But this is the order we will go in. And if we have time at the end, we will try to get to your questions, which again, you can type into the question box under your control panel. And uh, if, even if you have just some clarification questions, you know, we can try to get to those during the program. But uh, the more detailed ones, we will either try to get to at the end of the webinar or we will keep track of those questions and address them during, during the follow-up conference call, which is scheduled for Wednesday, May 28th, 4 o'clock Eastern, 3 o'clock Central. And you will be receiving information on how to plug into that conference call. But I really encourage you to participate in the conference call because all of the speakers will be on the conference call. So it will provide an opportunity to dialogue directly with the speakers, ask both the questions, that we don't get to today, as well as additional questions that might come up for you, and then also share your own expertise related to these topics. So please put that date on your calendar. So our first question is, how can you assess your local food system and make an informed decision about an entity or service that can fill a needed gap? So we're going to start with Eric Benfeld, who is an Extension Specialist with Virginia Cooperative Extension. So Eric, I will turn things over to you for a couple of minutes. Well, thank you, Kristen, and good afternoon. I'm actually answering uh, Kristen's question with a question. I think it's really important to ask why exactly are you looking at a food hub? and what opportunity or issue or problem you're trying to address or solve in establishing a, a food hub. As an extension specialist, I often receive calls, people interested or participating in a farmer's market or a community-supported agricultural operation, and then they're looking at a food hub. And I think an initial question is, like, why a food hub? Is it for market differentiation? Is it for job creation? Uh, are you looking at business development or diversification? Or are you trying to improve access, address issues of 
uh, food security or uh, food deserts, or is it an issue of uh, farmer development and profitability, and ultimately community vitality and resilience? I think ideally a food hub would address all of those, but I think it's from a beginning initial standpoint, it, it, it would help to shape your vision and your strategic plan if you have uh, original reason for looking at a food hub. And a couple of examples where people have helped to uh, expand and scale up some local and regional foods. One is the city of Louisville has recently hired a farm to table coordinator and the role of this person is trying to bridge the gap between producers and buyers in the Louisville metro area and uh, that seems to be one initial step of trying to build working uh, business relationships between producers and buyers and uh, I think that's something to consider because I think long-term relationships is uh, really important there. And then another example, you know, how, how do you get by without needing a structure or facility? And here in the Shenandoah Valley, a business that's developed over the past uh, three years, uh, they is really a uh, trucking and distribution company called Shenandoah Food, and they work closely with the local food hub out of Charlottesville. But again, they work uh, with many farmers in the Shenandoah Valley, making the connections, uh, being able to pick up uh, f fruit and vegetables and other produce from the farm and deliver it to retail as well as some institutional markets. So uh, I think that's a, another important piece to assess what uh, do you really need a structure facility or can you get by with existing resources. And I think it's also really important to identify the opportunity. We certainly hear about a, there's a very great demand for local foods, but assessing what is actual hype versus actual commitment to buying uh, local foods and regional foods. And I think doing a good job at assessing the demand and working with buyers that will actually commit to uh, working with local producers is very much important. And then also uh, having both producers and buyers, what we've seen in our area is that it, it seems to be uh, farmers that are scaling up somewhat from farmers markets and uh, community supported agriculture operations and that are devoting more of their operation to more wholesale and institutional markets. So that's really important. And I think also the entrepreneurial spirit and innovation, uh, you can't underestimate the need for a strong network of collaborators and cooperators, people that really want to succeed, see a food hub succeed. And then just the, having a diversity of private and public funding and identifying that there is a good fit and location for a food hub. Thank you, Eric. And uh, now we're going to switch over to Kathleen Perry with Appalachian Sustainable Development, who will answer uh, the same question. Thank you, Kristen. And I, I think that some of what I'm going to be doing is echoing what Eric just said. But um, what I would suggest that when you're looking at a food hub, that you start with with a collaborative mindset. It, it's what can you do to not reinvent the wheel. And so knowing initially who you are and what you bring to the table and, and who you're trying to serve. So what are the characteristics of the markets that you're wishing to serve? And, and do those characteristics actually align with the farmers in your area? Um, as you'll see on this next slide, you need to be deliberate about what the farmers you're working with they're willing to serve. So in a wholesale market, you can see from this chart that the pricing is low to medium but the product quality is high. 
and if your farmers are not interested in that type of a of a mix, then then you need to have a conversation about exactly what would work. Um, the next next slide would be I would say do your homework. So if you look at that previous slide, which was talking about wholesale versus direct, the scale of your farmers or the food producers or whatever um, part of the food value chain you're working with, what is it that they produce and in what quantities and what pricing expectations do they have? Um, then you need to really look at the local market opportunities. This um, picture of this map here, it's kind of hard to tell distance, but the very bottom most purple dot is a lot of where the product goes, and that's just north of Atlanta, and it's coming from southwest Virginia. So that's not real local, but it's all that was around where our farmers were. And so that distance really dictated the type of markets that we had available to our farmers. So after you've done that homework, then you're going to need to really do, obviously, more homework is once you've identified the markets that you wish to serve, who's currently serving them? Is it a nonprofit? Is there one in place that you could partner with? Are there farmers or, or even farmers who are aggregating products? Or is it a conventional distributor or a business that is serving those markets that you could partner with? I, I would always recommend that you not... Um, think that you can do something more affordably than someone who is doing this at a larger scale can. But of course you have to analyze whether that price um, difference that you might have from working with them is worth the is worth the hit. You'd also need to understand how markets are being accessed. You know, what kind of aggregation is in place, what kind of distribution is in place, and, and what's just like are there empty buildings that you can use. So to really try and think out of the box um, so that you can not reinvent the wheel. And then be clear about what expertise you're bringing to the table. And is there an opportunity for, for people to see value in collaborating with you so that you can then put together something that is sustainable and is not um, duplicating efforts? Because a lot of times what you'll find is supply is the issue. And so you don't want to be fighting with other, other food hubs for the same supply. Thank you, Kathleen. And now we're going to move on to Tina Pravat, who's going to also address this question. Yeah, I would second a lot of what Kathleen and Eric have said. Um, and then I'll add just sort of our history in um, how we how we <clears throat> did this work as First Hand Foods. Um, we were incubated and sort of came out of a, a nonprofit project um, called NC Choices. So that organization had been working with pasture-based livestock producers for about six to eight years and knew that we had a pool of capable farmers with products that chefs and retailers wanted and just didn't, there was not an effective way to market that product. Um, so the sort of our history of, of being a part of a larger nonprofit project accomplished a lot of what I um, have here in this slide as as necessary work, knowing that there was clear and demonstrated demand that was sort of and knowing that you have the farmers with the capacity to to produce to that market that was sort of in the background of this business idea and then um, one of the first things we did was do a pilot test with our local co-op grocery store called Weaver Street Market. So that pilot allowed us to um, test out systems, make sure that the willingness to pay was there, and that both from the, the retail customer and their end consumer. And then there were a number of um, farmers who were already having success selling into other aspects of the wholesale market, restaurants, and seeing a willingness to pay from those chefs. So we had some of these ingredients that I'm saying you've got to have here about clear demonstrated demand, um, evidence of willingness to pay, a sufficient pool of producers. But then the very first thing that we did was to build a financial model. Can we connect all these dots in a way that allows us to build a sustainable business? So, you know, answering these questions under the second bullet there, of what sort of gross margin do we need to operate on, do we hope to operate on, what will our cost of goods be, if, and then what does that mean we need to charge, 
how does this match up with what folks are currently paying? What scale do we need to hit to break even? Is that possible with the supply of product that we'll have in year one, in year two, in year three? Um, so we would have never um, even gone a step further if that financial model had sh shown us that this was just not feasible because our goal is to be a financially self-sustaining business. There's a lot of grant money out there, um, but that grant money will dry up in a few years and you need to be, you know, sustaining yourself. So luckily we've been a demand-driven business and we wouldn't have survived so far had we not been because we really, as we're a small team, we, we wouldn't have had the sales capacity that we needed to grow at the rate we have. Um, it's people have been coming to us. So the demand being strong with a strong willingness to pay in your region is has is key, I believe. Thank you, Tina. All right, we'll move on to the next question here. And that is how can you figure out how to position yourself in the local food system and what roles or services to take on? So we'll go back to Eric for this question. I think, I think uh, some of what I'm sharing here on this slide has already been touched on both by Kathleen and Tina. Uh, but I think, you know, particularly if looking at a business model and looking at long-term sustainability, really uh, realizing that research informs the strategy as well as the roles and services that uh, you can provide. So as much upfront research that you can conduct uh, before initiating a food hub, I think that will help um, in you know, finding your niche and your place in the market and uh, looking at, again, some of the major and minor crops, with if, specifically if you're looking with, at uh, produce and fruits and vegetables, what's being grown, again, trying to understand where the growth trends are for whether it's produce, meats, and value added. Uh, what ex what are the reasons for those trends? Are those trends going to continue? Um, and then does it actually translate into um, both demand and actual purchasing of the products that you'll be producing and uh, aggregating through a food hub? And again, I think uh, really identifying the type of farmers that exist in the area. One thing that we emphasize is that you know, farmers continually have to diversify all of their markets, uh, particularly in today's uh, marketplace. And then, again, what is feasibly, what can feasibly be raised in the area and uh, would echo again, trying to avoid any type of duplication of efforts in building the uh, food hub. And I think, uh, you know, particularly when you're thinking about scale, looking at what type of aggregation and distribution already exists in the area. Uh, you know, we have farmers that have grading and cooling and some packaging and processing equipment on the farm. Uh, so trying to evaluate uh, also what type of on-farm uh, refrigeration or storage is available. And then again, are there existing distributors that can fill the need for transportation so you don't have to rent a truck? And uh, I think an important thing is what can you get by without owning and having to maintain trucks and can you work with other people that already have the expertise in those areas? And I, th uh, I think we, we would all agree that there are some farmers that are marketers, but many that are getting into wholesale and institutional markets, they want to 
actually grow the produce and then be able to uh, hand the marketing off to somebody else. And then what we're seeing from uh, many people is that the buyers cannot go out to the farm. So uh, addressing the logistics there. And again, uh, particularly as we've worked with trying to build institutions, we hear over and over again that they want a consistent, reliable year-round supply. They don't want any inconsistencies, and they want uh, consistent quality. So as you work with farmers, you know, how can we address issues of seasonality so there is a consistent supply? And then also, uh, depending on the farmers that you're working with, how do you reduce the risk as well as cover any type of liability and um, certainly issues of food safety from farm to fork have become more and more important. So how do you uh, encourage food safety from the field to the plate is uh, an ongoing uh, question and something that needs to be addressed. And both uh, Kathleen and Tina have uh, mentioned the importance of surveying your market, actually getting out and talking with buyers. Uh, certainly uh, we see different types of food hubs, some that are more retail, some that are uh, based more on wholesale and institutional markets. So uh, getting an idea of who's actually creating the demand and who's actually buying product is really important. And then um, are farmers willing to make the transition from retail markets to wholesale markets? And um, I guess over and over again, is there significant demand for, for some products at, that lack adequate supply? And I think one thing that we're seeing is the demand is out there, but how do you uh, develop the supply and farmers to meet that demand is something else that needs to be s surveyed and worked on. Uh, Chris, I think you can go ahead with uh, the next slide. I think uh, we've touched on this, but I just identifying your markets and whether it's direct to consumer or wholesale. And then just con that having a continuous communication with the buyers to know exactly what they're looking for, what their customers are asking for and demanding, and then what type of services that you can provide both from an operational perspective as well as uh, informing your producers about what uh, buyers are looking for and helping helping uh, the producers to meet those uh, specifications and requirements. I think that will uh, that's a continuous continuous and ongoing process. Next slide. Hi, Eric. It's uh, Kristen. That's um, actually the last slide we have for this section. Was there something else you wanted to add? No, that's fine. Thank you, Eric. Um, so we'll move on uh, again to Kathleen, and also want to remind people that uh, for the webinar, you're muted. But if you do have questions, um, whether they're clarification questions or more detailed questions, you can type it into the question area of your control panel, and the way to open up that box is just click on the little triangle that's pointing towards the questions. If you click on that, the box will open up and you'll be able to type your questions in right there. And if we're not able to get to them during the webinar, we will get to them during the conference call. Thank you. Go ahead, Kathleen. Okay. So just a little context for the Appalachian Harvest Food Hub, which ASD operates. And and I think that it informs 
when you're thinking, when you're considering a food hub, it's just some of the elements that you need to think about. In our case, Appalachian Harvest is we're serving a very, very remote rural area. There's not that much tillable land. It's very mountainous. Um, it's small scale farmers that were transitioning from tobacco and, and there were really very limited local markets as I pointed out on that previous slide. So that really dictated what we were able to do, um, especially since, um, and you can go to the next one, what we were, we did this starting 14, 15 years ago and there really wasn't much um, interest in local food at the time. So saying we're going to change the local populace's attitudes about local food didn't, we're working on that, but it wasn't a, a short-term strategy. So what we have learned over the last several years is from an aggregation perspective, I look back now and I wish we'd bought, we had built or used multiple smaller aggregation facilities. When you're talking about a really rural area, because the distance to travel for farmers is so is so problematic um, and impacts their profitability so much, and then but then also being creative about who you can partner with. Over the last few years, we have really done a much better job than we did initially with partnering with others who have product moving up and down the road, and we do that in a variety of different ways. Um, and and I would just and, and you could do this in a million different ways based on where you are and who is there. So just be be aware of what's moving around in your area. I mean, we found one uh, buyer who could pick up from us simply because we saw their truck driving through our little town. So it, it's just keep your eyes open. We have found that in our case, the distribution of our products has been accomplished most cost effectively and most carbon friendly using tractor trailers. That is not the case everywhere, but it has taken us a while to get to that stage. And then, I mean, I think it's been um, mentioned by everyone else that owning and operating infrastructure shouldn't be the be all and end all. It should not be the goal because you really don't want to. You're going to have to operate this post grants if you go down the grant route, but as Tina pointed out, it's best to not focus on that. And, and I'm, a, a, though we have trucks and we use them well, I'm a, passionate um, dissuader of owning trucks. And then also on the next slide, uh, learning from your partners. One of the things that we have been really fortunate about is being able to work with places like Whole Foods or Ingalls or, or freight brokers to find out from them what is it that we don't know. It's, it's so hard to do some of this work when you don't have a clue what you don't know. And so, um, we have worked a lot with our, our partners. It was mentioned that you should really determine whether there is demand or if it's just hype. We work with our large wholesale buyers every off season to identify just how much of whatever products they're interested in and what else can we work with you on, what new products, um, and how can we work with you to do backhauls so that our trucks are not leaving your facility empty. Because even if it's a, a small truck, it's better that it's not empty. Tractor trailer makes it even worse, but it's always an opportunity to in, earn additional income. Um, keeping an eye out for how um, how you can collaborate. Let me just go on to the next slide. Just to give you some examples, we work with one partner who is um, providing us with the opportunity to cross use their facility for cross docking. They are much larger than we are, so they will be able to get a lower box price. So it doesn't hurt them if we buy boxes from them, and it helps us because we get a lower price. We also, they have a much um, greater capacity to uh, generate ice for icing down broccoli for distribution, and they'll even send us buckets or actually bins of ice back to our facility when we're in our peak season. And it doesn't really cost them that much, but it truly helps us, and it, it makes both of us stronger collaborators. And so I would just encourage looking for those kinds of opportunities that you're not constantly asking your collaborators to do for you, but what are the different things that wouldn't cost anything but would, would help you both. Thank you, Kathleen. And uh, we'll move on to Tina now to address that same question. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think it's been said before, um, don't reinvent the wheel, and um, I would put that another way is um, don't try to do everything. 
Um, for us, there were a lot of broken things about our local meat supply chain, and there was a temptation to go in and try and fix everything and own trucks and be a further processor. And in the end, we just took on aggregation, marketing, and sales. Um, we partner for distribution. We partner for processing and further fabrication. Um, and we share a facility with another food hub called Eastern Carolina Organics. Um, I think when you're thinking about what roles to play, if there are a lot of broken things, we just had to look at what are the, the biggest pain points on either end of our supply chain. What, is the, what are the biggest pain points for our farmers? What are the big biggest pain points for the potential customers? And for farmers, pasture-based livestock producers here, that was whole animal utilization and access to markets. So they didn't want to have to figure out how to move every single piece of that animal. They wanted to drop it off at the slaughterhouse and be done. And that's what we allow them to do. Um, we take ownership of the animal once it's at the slaughterhouse. And we, we, we do all the footwork to create the access to those markets. We're closer to the, to the demand than they are in, being in Durham and more um, metropolitan area. Um, for our customers, that pain point was of a consistent, reliable supply without, that didn't have them needing to talk to 20 different farmers every week. They can call, they wanted to be able to call one point of contact and get as much of what they needed each week. And that is what we accomplished for our, for our customers. Um, so, yeah, we partner with two small-scale slaughterhouses, one for beef and one for pork. Um, we're pretty lucky here in North Carolina in terms of our infrastructure around slaughterhouse. Um, there are plenty of people who still complain about it and say we need more plants. But if you look across the country, um, we're, our distance to processors, we're much better than a lot of other folks. Um, we also partner for distribution. Um, we sort of fell into a relationship with a, a regional seafood distributor, and that's been a great partnership for us. We don't have competing products, but we have a shared customer base and a shared need for cold chain management. Um, and then we are, like I said, we share a facility with Eastern Carolina Organics. It's a fairly new facility. It's not where we started, um, but it is something that they they refurbished a warehouse late 2012 and we're tenants in that space. We share a cooler. We share things like loading docks, pallet jacks, forklifts, um, all kinds of packing materials and supplies. So um, it allows for lots of nice shared resources. We also have some shared customer bases. There's a lot of sort of, I hate using this word, but uh, synergy in, in the space here. You know, their customers come to visit them. They stop by and say hi to us and vice versa. Um, so it's a nice, a nice space to be in. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say. I think that for partnerships to work, they need to be truly mutually beneficial. And um, while you are trying to create a financially self-sustaining business, you shouldn't be doing that at the expense of your partners. Um, and in, everything needs to be win-win for it to be sustainable. Thank you, Tina. All right, let's move on to the next question. Once you have an idea of your position, what are the options for business models that might suit your role or service well? So we'll start with Eric. Eric, are you there? Yes. Uh, I think an important element is to know exactly what your position is in the value chain. As Tina mentioned, we want to create win-win-win situations for people, and uh, I think aligning values uh, up and 
across the value chain is certainly important. If we look at food hubs across the country, they typically have provide different services, but knowing exactly where your food hub fits so that uh, particularly uh, so you can have a phased approach in developing the food hub for long-term sustainability, I think that's, and profitability, that's really important. We can uh, go to the next slide. And I think what we've heard from both Kathleen and Tina is the importance of cooperation as well as sort of friendly competition where possible and you know how do you build strategic alliances across and up and down the the value chain is really important and I think also as you're building uh, your team your food hub team also having complementary skills as well as relationships and networks is is really important and uh, and hopefully as you build the networks that uh, everyone will work to try to build the long-term market and encourage uh, success and and appropriate competition. Next slide. And I think both Tina and Kathleen, you know, the importance of having a strategic plan to really work at developing the food hub either incrementally or having a phased implementation is really important. Uh, what type of business organization and what's an acceptable governance structure for the uh, either the culture or the farmers in your areas really important. Also what type of a structure can facilitate uh, de decision making, you know, how can you make timely decisions, uh, will you be dependent more on grants or loans, do you have more of a social mission and looking at providing uh, services to the community, but then also uh, how, are, how are you really going to differentiate yourself in the market realizing that uh, in actuality, you're, you, in many cases, you're actually having to displace somebody else from the market. So how do you differentiate yourself? And uh, I think other considerations is how are you going to generate capital and also investment? And then what's the most appropriate style and fit for, for the food hub and the people that you're working with? Next slide, please. And I think both Kathleen and Tina have mentioned uh, it seems like you really need a structure that gives you the most flexibility. You know, are you going to rely on grant funding if you're a nonprofit? Uh, if you're a for profit, are there opportunities for loans? Really understanding w what your niche is or service or sweet spot is, and then building on that. And I think the the food hubs that I've worked with is really identifying both your anchor suppliers, your anchor buyers or tenants or entrepreneurs and business partners is um, really an, an important consideration. And and over and over again, I've heard uh, you know what can you do without capital outlays and expenditures, and are there ways to optimize your assets that are not on your financial books and uh, one example is a food hub in Vermont where the equipment is owned by the Chamber of Commerce but then the equipment is maintained by the food hub and so that allows them to, to process meats at their food hub. Uh, next slide please. It seems like uh, there's many different business models and each seem to have their fit in place but you know with, they, with the ultimate goal of viability and a self-sustaining stream of uh, income and revenues there's quite uh, diverse models from non-profits to for-profits with limited liability corporations some cooperatives and then 
in some states there's the option for the low profit limited liability company and so um, I think that all needs to be evaluated but in most cases whatever structure gives you the most flexibility particularly in the initial years of establishing a food hub is really important next slide that's done Thank you, Eric. And uh, now we'll move on to Kathleen to address the same question. Okay. Well, the, the business model that ASD elected years ago was, first of all, um, ASD itself is a nonprofit, and Appalachian Harvest works as just a program under the nonprofit. Um, as Erickson and Tina, our goal is financial self-sufficiency and so finding a way to get there and we're not there yet but this, but we're quite close now uh, we are definitely a little bit different in that we sell directly to distribution centers so we we need to fill up a large truck and get it affordably to a distribution center where it is unloaded we don't deliver direct to stores we just deliver to the center and then they take care of that which is a much more cost-effective means of distribution for, for our particular model um, all of the produce is aggregated in, at our facility in Duffield so that it can be inspected and so we can follow our food safety rules and regulations. We have multiple income streams, as Eric just mentioned. We broker some products, we buy and sell some products, and then we also serve as a for hire backhauler. So we'll do, um, just as an example, we'll go in, down north of Atlanta to deliver products and then we will, after the truck is empty, go all the way into Atlanta and pick up a load of something like, you know, baby formula and then haul it for a fee to another destination if we don't have any produce that could be moved. So that's just another way of earning income from on the assets that we have. And the next slide is um, we really never – cooperatives in our area, that's not a good word for many of our farmers. And so that was not ever really an option for us. Um, and so we ended up just kind of working together to get this started years ago. And it just made sense that combining products from multiple farmers made distribution more affordable. And selling product on a consignment basis, which is what we have done for most of the time, um, up until the last couple of years when we've been able to do some buying and selling, we just had to do that from a cash flow perspective. So figuring out how, how quickly are your buyers going to pay so that you can pay your farmers if you don't have a pool of money that you can use to be floating that, those receivables. Initially, we offered a lot of services, and I know that this has been addressed, but we offer, as an example, we would wash and grade produce for farmers. And, and frankly, we were never particularly wonderful at it. And it cost us a lot of money, and it cost our farmers. And so we eventually, even though we knew the produce needed to be graded, washed, and, and sized appropriately and labeled, it, it just didn't seem like an intelligent thing for us to do. So we, we, we lowered our rates that we were charging and then trained the farmers how to do that. And I wish that we had done that years ago because we needed to just own the fact that we were not doing a great job at that. Um, and then focus on those areas that we do a wonderful job, which is marketing and, and distribution. Um, additionally, and, and this is something we started two or three years ago, was we believe firmly in training farmers on like GAP certification or how to access um, organic certification, but, but we were burdening the business itself with that, and we have separated in our financials the nonprofit and the, and the more transactional for-profit activities so that we can raise funds for doing those nonprofit training type activities and not burden the business. And it has just given us a much clearer picture of where we are financially. Thank you, Kathleen. And uh, now Tina will also address that question. Um, we sort of knew from the start that we wanted to be a for-profit business. Um, that was um, somewhat informed by um, similar sentiment in our producer community that no one really wanted to be part of a co-op. Um, I personally, some of it was personal in that I was in business school at the time working on an MBA and I was very um, 
enthused about this concept of triple bottom line business and wanted to demonstrate that it's possible to run a business responsibly, uh, being stewards of the land and treating farmers how they should be treated and, and to do that um, in a profitable way. So to me that's still still the grand experiment, but I was there's a sort of personal bent for me t that wanted to demonstrate that there's a way to do this business um, well, to do it good. And um, so we started with those two kind of points and we landed on an LLC as the right structure for us, um, primarily because it allowed for optimum flexibility. It allowed us to include our farmers in our structure in in the future, we, we're not there yet, but for example, we want to do profit sharing with our farmers and an LLC has a ton of flexibility. They don't have to be shareholders in order to receive distributions from the business. We can write them into our operating agreement really just about any way we want. So um, it allows for innovation, I feel like, and this um, world of food hubs and how to structure them is a place to be innovative. Um, the downside of the LLC is that, is that it is the tax implications. It's a pass-through organization, which means um, those taxes. We right now we the ownership is split 50/50 between myself and my business partner. Uh, we will be bringing in key employees as giving them equity stakes, um, but because it's a pass-through, any um, net positive income that we have goes directly onto our personal income taxes. And grant funds do count as income. And so we we received a good bit of grant funds to get off the ground and we have to, those, that money shows up on my personal income tax statement every year and I get to pay the taxes on that. The business reimburses me for that, um, but it does get very personal very quickly in that, you know, you lose certain deductions, you, it has impacts on how much you can contribute to your retirement account, and those sort of things can't be reimbursed in a dollar for dollar way. So it's just something to keep in mind if, um, if this is not a, if it's a project that has a lot of more stakeholders than yourself and you're going to be an owner, it will have some personal impacts on you if you choose to be an LLC. Thank you, Tina. And we're coming up on our last question. And again, just want to remind folks, if you have any questions of your own, please uh, type them into the question box on your control panel. So our last question is, how can you create strong, mutually beneficial relationships with local farmers? How can you communicate truthfully about the benefits and expectations of marketing through this business? And we'll start again with Eric. Thank you, Kristen. I think we've heard over and over the importance of uh, both transparency with the food hub operators as well as the growers and just information flow all along uh, from production to processing to aggregation to distribution and finally to the market is is just vitally important. And I think also just really be, being very clear about what expectations the food hub has as, as well as uh, what buyers have and continuing to communicate with producers and providers specifically about price points and what the roles are for each one in that business relationship. And I think uh, the third point, balancing supply and demand, I think particularly for maybe younger food hubs that even though you've seen, maybe you've seen some growth that uh, maybe not uh, realizing that you just have to, it's, it's always a challenge of balancing supply and demand so that you're not over-promising something to your producers that at the same time um, uh, not over-committing yourselves there. And I think also just 
knowing your marketing customer base is really important and not trying to be all things to all people, but really knowing where you can find a good, good place in the marketplace and serve your customers. And again, uh, trying to communicate the values that you hold and how you can help to make a mutually beneficial relationship both for producers as well as uh, buyers and customers is really important. One of the things that ASD has really tried to do is, is particularly over the last few years, be very deliberate about who is appropriate for the markets that we're serving. And so we've tried to do two things, and one is to be really, really clear with the farmers with whom we work about what is involved in the markets that we have available for them. And, and what we've encouraged them to do is, is evaluate what's out there and, and look at that through the lens of what their own strengths and weaknesses are. Um, Eric said earlier there are some folks who don't really want to be marketers. They're, they're not marketers. Some of them, frankly, have a personality to not be marketers, and they just assume just grow and have somebody else sell it. If that's the way you are looking at things, you need to, A, acknowledge that, and, B, you need to be sure to put a value on the time that you would have spent marketing. And so we – we kind of walk through this. We also believe in, in market diversity so that if you can sell to like a large wholesale as well as to a farmer's market or to restaurants, we think that's optimal because you get um, some insulation from pricing variances as well as, as different volumes. Um, and on the next slide, it, one of the things that we strongly suggest is that people develop a marketing plan and that will take into account all the things that they do and do not have access to so that they can figure out what makes the most sense for them. Um, one of the things that we have seen in the farmers that we work is a lot of times they don't seem to value their own time to the extent that they ought to. And, and that includes logistics and driving from point A to point B to deliver product. One of the, one of the small enterprises we operate is it's a small fee, but if they only make one delivery versus six, it makes sense for them financially as well as, as for ASD. In the next slide, um, what quantities of products does the market that you're thinking that you want to serve bear? And then figuring out what that translates into, what are you willing to do, what are you capable of doing, and what are the fixed and variable costs for each of these? You know, do you do more packaging with a wholesale versus a retail? What, what can you, you know, the quality is a whole lot um, higher for a large wholesale buyer, but can you make that up with in volume? And so figuring out how you can do that as well as, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just ASD that needs to maximize routes for our Appalachian Harvest enterprise, farmers need to, ma to maximize their routes. They need a you know, carpool product if possible. But, but looking at, at all of that, when you're trying to make a decision on the, the markets that you're going to serve, we created a, a spreadsheet and a, and a small pamphlet just for beginning farmers who are trying to figure out what that looks like. And on the next slide is just a, a quick snapshot of you know, if you balanced restaurant, farmers market, and wholesale, the, the price points are one consideration, and the volume is another, and the time and effort is another. And we created a tool that will help farmers kind of walk through that so that they can figure out what is the, um, the most effective use of their time. Um, for us, um, the, the most important thing in maintaining strong relationships with our farmers is that we pay them well and we pay them often. And um, by that I mean, you know, as soon as the product comes in our door, we're writing checks the, the next time our bookkeeper is in. So our terms are, there's quick turnaround on when we receive their product and when they get a check. And we deal with a lot of low resource farmers, so that's important. Um, if I if I don't get a check to them that week, I get a call. Um, so that's been the number one thing. Um, and then making sure that they feel a part of something. Um, relationships, I've been astounded by how important relationships 
are to this business. I mean, the business is nothing but relationships. It all comes down to to those relationships, maintaining them, and making sure people feel valued and include, included in something. Um, so we visit our farmers regularly. We do farm visits regularly. We have an annual producer meeting with each pool of producers, both our beef and our pork producers. Um, we set our annual pricing at that meeting so that these farmers are not price takers when they're working with us. They're price makers. We, we set our pricing, what we're going to pay them in conversation. And that conversation means they have to understand our markets, our willingness, I mean, their willingness to pay, and our financial situation. So transparency is key to the whole thing. We're very open with them about our, our numbers, what percentage of our revenues are going to them versus the processors versus the, um, the sustaining the business. And, you know, what are our sales goals? Are we hitting them or not? Um, another big part of having them feel a part of something is telling their story. So we sometimes refer to our brand as an umbrella brand. We do have a brand. We've invested heavily in making an appealing brand that has name recognition in our region. Um, but we also tell our farmers' stories. They have profiles. They all have profiles on our websites. We use their photographs. Um, in our point of sale materials and their face, we we're bringing the face of the farmer to the consumer. And we found that our farmers love that. They like, there's a lot of pride in being able to point folks to our website or if we post pictures on our Facebook page, they will share that with their friends and um, it really does facilitate that goal of what we want, of having them feel valued and feel a part of something. And then I put fun as the last point on here. Um, we're running a business, but we also want to have fun and, and um, have true relationships with these folks. So we have parties. We, we invite them to our annual customer appreciation party. We take our customers to their farms. Um, we send them annual newsletters telling them fun things that we're up to. We bring them to sampling events um, with some of our bigger customers, like uh, university campuses. They get to meet the students and chefs that are working with their product. And that's very exciting for these folks who live out in rural North Carolina and don't, don't get to meet the fancy chefs at the white tablecloth restaurants that are getting James Beard Awards. They, they love making those connections. Um, so I was going to say, oh, yeah, like this, the, actually this Sunday we're having our warehouse party. We've got about 50 different local chefs coming and probably around 20 of our farmers are coming. So those folks will get to meet each other. We're feeding them. We're creating some community for the supply chain. Thank you, Tina. And uh, Keith Richards is just going to outline a couple of the questions that come in, and we'll see if we can uh, have the speakers just briefly address them. Go ahead, Keith. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, we've just got a few minutes left, but uh, there are a couple questions that I hope we can address quickly. Um, one of them is around the LLC, a little bit more about um, uh, what is a low-profit LLC, um, and how how did you form it? Did you need an attorney to form it? I'm sure you could go on and on about this, Tina, but can you just give a little bit more specifics about that, please? We are actually not an L3C, which is what you're talking about. We're just a standard LLC. Um, that's because at the time we were forming, um, L3C was a really new structure in North Carolina, and our attorney advised us against it. She was not clear that it would achieve what we wanted to achieve and felt like it was a sort of untested legal structure. Um, so we, we steered away from that. Um, I think that we can achieve everything we want to achieve in terms of profit sharing um, with a standard LLC structure. I mean, I don't know a ton about L3Cs. I think it's a, a powerful marketing tool and a nice way to talk about yourself, but I don't know that it allows you to do anything that you can't do in a um, 
a typical LLC structure. I, w I would just add to Tina that you know, currently there's nine states that allow that, and I think actually North Carolina might actually be repealing some of that uh, from being allowed in their state. But it is uh, in the states that have allowed it, it's trying to combine sort of a social enterprise with a for-profit business to achieve uh, multiple goals. But again, it's limited to about nine states currently. Thanks. Uh, Tina, can you also just address um, who owns the LLC? Um, that's myself um, and my business partner, Jennifer Curtis. And it's we we never intended to be business owners when we started down this journey of creating first-hand foods. We, we, we approached this work as consultants. There was a problem that needed to be solved. I was a business student, and so the first thing we did was build a financial model. Then we um, wrote a business plan, and all that was part of my coursework, and um, all it got heavily vetted by a community of entrepreneurs here in the Triangle. Um, the whole time we were doing that work, we were thinking, okay, we're, we're, we're solving this problem. We're, we're writing the plan of what needs to be done. I wonder who's going to do this. <laughs> who's going to be this business owner? And um, you know, meanwhile, Jennifer was raising the grant funds through NC Choices. NC Choices had been getting a lot of uh, grant support from the Kellogg Foundation, um, and they had been a historic funder of their work. And she was um, trying to convince them to carve out a portion of that funding to support the incubation of this business model, this business idea. And she was successful in doing that. And we just eventually realized, oh, we're the entrepreneurs here. We've got to just do this. We've got to be the business owners. No one's stepping up to, you know, run with this business plan. So we kind of happened into being entrepreneurs, and us being the owners is what needed to happen to make it work. I mean, I'm grateful for that. I think it's quite amazing to be uh, my own boss and own this business that's a constant learning experience and challenge. Um, but it's not. That's not where we came to it from, um, but it's just where we landed. Thanks, Tina. Um, we do have a couple more questions now that have rolled in, but we're a little bit past our hour, and so I'm just going to finish with one more, if that's okay with Kristen. Um, we had somebody that asked, um, how do you deal with farmers that aren't keeping up with the quality or the product or the quantity of your product? Um, either uh, any of the three of you, but especially Kathleen or Tina. Well, this is Kathleen. I mean, that, that has always been one of the challenges, and I, I think that one of the things that we have seen is it is necessary to expend some resources educating and re-educating with your farmers. And, and one of the things that we have found over the years is that some folks um, have some challenges ever getting to that point. And so you just sort of, we've sort of factored that in to our plans. Um, if that doesn't sound too harsh. So, you know, we do our best to train, and if that doesn't seem to be taking, we sort of discount how much someone is actually going to be able to deliver. But that that is always one of the challenges and, and issues with weather, particularly um, in specialty crop production, makes it even more challenging because sometimes it just is difficult to predict. Yeah, we, um, we've taken the approach of providing a lot of quality feedback. It's taken us some time to figure out the right ways to collect data on quality and communicate it back to folks. Um, but we have programs for doing that with both beef and pork. And we're going to be tying our profit sharing to that quality feedback. So the top performers will receive um, I'm not sure exactly what we're calling it, but they'll get sort of bonus checks at the end of the year for being um, the best quality producers. Um, we have had to sort of cut a few folks out because their quality was just consistently bad, and we sort of took a three strikes and you're out approach. Um, we still paid them for the product. We didn't, they, they raised the animals. 
we got them, we sold them, but those, so we pay for it, but it, it costs us a lot when the quality goes down. When, when a, a, you know, we have, one problem we have is consistent size of the loin and the pork, and it'll be great for weeks, and then you'll have one bad week, and your chefs are up in arms, and they're sending product back, and so we can only do that so many times before we just say, okay, we can't accept product from you anymore. And that with the caveat that the folks who got to that third strike, they weren't doing anything to show an interest in improving their production. Um, so like um, Kathleen said, education is a big part of it. We, we What we've learned is that our pork producers never see their product. They never um, taste their own pork. They send the hog away and um, they don't see what it looks like on the inside or when it's on a plate or when it's in a package, vacuum sealed package. So we took, you know, we took the product back to them and we showed them this is what a good loin looks like. This is what a not so great loin looks like. This is what a pork belly, this is what we want it to look like. This is way too fatty. And that was a, an amazing experience. I mean, their jaws dropped. They couldn't believe um, the difference. And and we could directly tie those quality differences back to breeding and feeding and things. And so these, some of the folks who were skimping on investing in improving their production could directly see the impacts of that. Um, and so if they were seeing those impacts and still not making the investments needed to improve their quality, then they were out of the network. Thanks, Tina. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, we are um, where we need to end on this. Um, one more teaser. We've had another question come in, um, and I'm sure many of the other of, of you may have others. Um, but another question's come in about how why co-ops are a bad word and, and how you might repair that with, with farmers, how we might all do that. So that's just a teaser that we will uh, discuss that on our follow-up conference call in a couple weeks. So, um, uh, Kristen, you want to end us here? Yes. Thank you, Keith, for handling the questions. And uh, thank you so much, Eric, Kathleen, and Tina, for your time and expertise. And as we mentioned, uh, all three of them will be available on the follow-up conference call. None of you will be muted during the conference call, so we can all dialogue. Um, we can have them address the question that Keith raised and also any other questions you may have. If there's anything in particular you would like them to discuss on a follow-up conference call, if you want to send uh, Keith or I an email ahead of time um, so that uh, the, the presenters have some time to think about it, that would certainly be fine. Um, or we can just uh, answer questions as they come up during the conference call and dialogue further and also hear from you about your experiences with these topics. So um, thanks again to Chelsea Simpson with the National Farm to School Network for hosting and archiving this webinar. It will be available as a recording and we will provide that information to you as well as the information on how to dial in to the follow-up conference call on May 28th. So thank you everyone and have a good evening. Bye-bye.